everyone. Um, it's great to see you. I can see um, Catherine, Bushra, and Florentina, and myself. And if you're a member of the audience to this session, you've joined the session on international perspectives. So in this session, um, we'd like to talk about different countries, different regions in the world, and how energy policy, climate change, and also climate justice are being discussed in these countries, whether they're discussed, which ones are the big stakeholders in these countries, or just, you know, as we represent or we've worked in these countries, what do we learn about the um, public discussion on climate change in these, in these countries? Uh, my name is uh, Katrin Goldhammer. I'm the managing director of RLI, which is one of the organizations heavily involved in this uh, conference, and I hope you've had a good time until now. Um, and uh, in the next, say, 45 minutes, I'm going to be talking to Katrin Buschra and Florentina, and I'd like to quickly introduce them to you. And you're going to have plenty of time to also tell us more about the work that you do, because it is connected to the issues that we're talking about today. So Buschra and I, we've met um, in 2019. I visited Oman at the time. And um, Buschra is the Director of Planning and Economics at the Oman Power and Water Procurement. And um, Bushra, you have a degree in business law and in public policy, and you've worked in, in energy for a very long time. And you're a native of Oman, is that right? And you currently live in Muscat. Right. Yes, that's correct, well, thank yes. You for, thank you for coming. Um, and then uh, Katrin Riga is here. Uh, Katrin is a political scientist, and she leads the communications department at the uh, European Climate Foundation in Germany. And the European Climate Foundation is basically a philanthropy dedicating its work towards uh, net zero greenhouse gas emissions, uh, right? Okay, thank you for joining. And um, Florentina Koppenborg is with us as well. She has a degree in Japanese studies and also political science. And she's worked and lectured in Japan. And she is now a postdoc at the uh, Chair of Environmental and Climate Policy at the Technical University of Munich. Uh, thank you for, um, for joining us, Florentina. And uh, myself, I've uh, done part of my PhD in Japan. I'm very interested in energy policy in the country. Uh, I've worked in, in Germany and Europe for a long time in the energy industry. And uh, I've met a few very important and very interesting people when I was in Oman talking to them about energy policy and also environmental policy. And um, this is why I've chosen these three countries or these three areas of, of interest of mine for this session. So it's a purely, uh, <laughs> purely self-interest uh, um, inspired uh, session and I hope you'll enjoy it. Um, because I'm, I'm most interested in the similarities and the differences between you know, the, these countries. So when we talk about climate change, um, in, in Germany and in Europe, I'm pretty sure that some of these things are similar in, in the countries that you've looked into or they're very different. Um, can I ask you, Bushra, to tell us a little bit about the situation in Oman? Many of our audiences probably haven't been to the country or they uh, don't know well the energy situation and the energy policies. Uh, what do we need to know about it and how does it relate to um, climate change? Okay, thank you very much for that uh, introduction, Catherine. Um, uh, Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's evening time here um, in Oman. Uh, Oman, so Oman is a country of the Gulf, one of the GCC, six GCC countries. Uh, it's an oil exporter. So in terms of energy, we have a lot of oil, we have a lot of gas, we export both oil and gas. Uh, and because we have a lot of gas, uh, almost 98% of our el electricity is generated using gas. So in terms of uh, environmental cleanliness, I think um, the country feels proud that it doesn't use coal or, you know, dirtier, dirtier uh, sources mm -hmm. um, of energy. Uh, although, you know, in some rural areas, we still rely heavily on diesel, but that's slowly sort of disappearing, uh, both for environmental reasons and for economic reasons, since it's uh, much more expensive to use uh, diesel. Um, 
So, and since Oman is uh, heavily reliant on oil, it exports oil, but it's not much of an industrial, industrialized nation. So we don't have much industrial activities. Um, our population is around 5 million, including, you know, non-Omanis in the country. It's a small population. Uh, and because the population is small and the economic activity is small, we don't see ourselves as um, producing a lot of industrial waste uh, or, you know, carbon emissions and, you know, um, impacting the environment uh, negatively. You know, this is the general perspective. I'm talking about the country and not... Uh, my personal one. Uh, and I think this is where sometimes when we talk about the environment, um, Omanis don't usually feel that, you know, the actions here lead to any climate change or impact on climate. Um, the general feeling is that, you no, know, it's the other industrialized nations maybe that do it and we're doing fine and, you know, and maybe it's this this kind of thinking um, and sort of lack of... Uh, 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 being able to see the indirect impacts of any of our actions on the climate is uh, maybe sometimes, you know, stopping uh, some actions uh, that could benefit uh, the environment. So that's uh, just generally as, a, as an introduction. However, um, as a population, as policymakers, they're very keen on supporting the environment whenever possible. They love the environment. And I think they think what they're doing is always the best thing for the environment, but they just don't know that there's actually a better way to do things. I think um, this, this sort of misinformation and lack of awareness is the most interesting part for uh, supporting uh, the climate and, and the environment. Um, that's a very general perspective. I don't know um, how much in depth you'd like me to go here. <laughs> Maybe you could contrast this a little bit with the work that you do. I, I presume that at the organization that you work for, probably renewable energy or carbon emissions might play a role when you look into, you know, setting up new electricity generation. Maybe there is a policy that guides you. How does it affect you as a professional person? So I've been uh, working with the electricity sector for more than a decade now. Uh, and I remember a decade ago uh, when we were exploring renewable energy, solar and wind, and, you know, Oman has a lot of sun, um, uh, so it's an obvious choice to use solar. Uh, it was quite difficult to move forward with this policy. Uh, so even though everybody was keen on it, once uh, we'd look at the costs and the economics, and um, if you just look at the direct costs and not the indirect impact of, you know, uh, you know, gas powered plants, uh, the immediate reaction would be no, don't go for renewables at that time. So that was 10 years ago. Today, we have already a policy in place uh, to have 10% of our uh, energy generated from renewable sources by 2025. So the the landscape is completely changed. It's it's forcing us to you know look differently and and see how we can move to renewables, and the policy is uh, to move to thirty percent by twenty thirty, so it's a much larger um, uh, percentage. Uh, the ten percent by twenty twenty five was actually only instituted I think uh, two or three years ago, so it wasn't that long ago from having almost zero percent renewables to 10 percent that's huge that's significant and it's changing a lot and it's suddenly this realization that there's this this potential in renewables that you know we didn't see before and we didn't utilize so the landscape is really changing in terms of uh, generating uh, electricity um we see more companies exploring with uh, renewable energy even within their own buildings you know solar rooftop um, and even though this didn't exist before, I think one of the fundamental incentives that allowed them to go forward is because uh, the subsidy system has been reformed, the electricity subsidy system. And we, we, you know, we, we know that in theory, but when we actually applied it in Oman, it's amazing how once the large companies, we stopped subsidizing them, immediately the, the flow towards either renewable energy or energy efficiency and how can we become more energy efficient is, is huge and it's significant. And I think it's always about the system. You know, if, if you have the right incentives in place, it's the best thing you can do for the climate rather than focusing on a project or, or, or a company, you know. And you're saying energy efficiency, right? Because probably in a country like Oman, cooling 
right? Cooling of buildings is probably a significant, probably, I don't know, even the highest share of electricity use uh, today, right? And that is a very big contrast to most countries in Europe, especially to Germany, where uh, cooling isn't that impactful, but it's also an issue in Japan, right? We're going to talk about this a little later. Um, Katrin, you have worked mainly in, in Germany and Europe, right? When it comes to climate policies or climate discussion, um, do you recognize some of the things as similar to the discussion that we're having over here? Are there are things very different? What would you say? So I was pretty much struck by that you did not mention the big Paris Agreement. So uh, I feel that uh, all conversations um, in the insider circles, but now with this new movement of students, um, this has become more and more mainstream. I mean, it's quite a technical debate and it's all about um, multilateralism and so on, but it has become kind of a mainstream issue, I would say, in the public debate. Maybe not for my, my mother or my grandmother, but um, it is really kind of this lighthouse where we're heading. So I was quite uh, struck that you didn't, didn't, didn't mention it. Um, uh, yeah, would you like to, to explore me a bit about the conversations we have in Germany or... Uh, yeah. Yes, but let me let me ask Pushka real quick about the Paris Agreement. Is that something that an average person would know about in Oman, do you think? No. Not really. Not really. I think the most people who actually know about it are are uh, innovative companies or SMEs uh, that want to install more solar rooftops or, you know, have energy efficient products. Because that's one thing they see as okay, it could push the consumers to to uh, you know for for our business but actually the awareness on the ground is is very little um they hear about it they know it's about the climate they have no idea what oman is doing uh, there you know do we have any targets or not and to be honest our targets are not maybe the strongest targets amongst other countries um so when it comes to these things it's usually the government that pushes um, the population more towards uh, becoming greener and more efficient, you know? Yeah, that's something to talk about, right? Because that is very different from uh, Germany. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is our government, you know, pushing us anywhere? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, Kathleen, do you want to, do you want to talk a little bit about it? Do you think, you know, pushes and pulls in Germany are distributed in the same way? Yeah, so, um, I mean, two years ago, the debate in Germany has been quite very different than in, in Europe overall. Um, so I started to work on climate in 2006, 2007, and there we had like the first peak of interest in climate issues when the IPCC report came out and it was all leading towards Copenhagen con climate, climate Conference. And then there was this failure so people say on the policy side it wasn't maybe that failure but but for the public discourse it was so we um when you google when you do some uh, a quick google trends analysis or do the media look in media databases you see this big decline in public uh, discussion about the topic so and it was it was really a huge investment also from philanthropy but also um NGOs and so on to keep that up to a certain level again in the run up to the Paris uh, conference. And I think um, we've learned a lot from the Copenhagen conference. So for example, there have been these um, campaigns. One I recall is tick, tick, tick. So doing this really pressure moments. And then you have this big moment where you need to have a decision. It doesn't come, you don't have an agreement. And then the debate for years was kind of off. And uh, Paris was done much better. So there was this big investment from, from philanthropy, from other organizations, and it was quite a, a global effort. It was a lot of expectation. Management. So we had a lot of scenarios of what do we say when it fails? <laughs> and um, so that was a, a big milestone, but then the major change happened in 2018, 2019. So we saw a real a switch in the debate. Um, and that was mainly around Greta Thunberg starting to demonstrate and um, then the German climate movement, but um, other students around Europe also joining in and starting this regular protest. And I would say that that was really a game changer and created a movement. And I would say it was actually the first move, movement on climate that we've said this existed before. I, I wouldn't say that. I think there is now a real movement on climate um, action. And uh, as a communications person, 
I was quite reluctant to talk about the Paris Agreement, to talk about 1.5, to talk about two degrees, you know, all this kind of stuff is pretty technical to talk about a carbon budget. I thought we need to be more concrete. We need to talk about the benefits of renewables, uh, the opportunities of a transition, the benefits for consumers and so on. I think we still need to do that, but um, it's really amazing to see how the student movement brought the debate to a new, well, mainstream, a, a certain technical debate actually to talk about Paris, to make this the Lighthouse project mm -hmm. uh, in the public debate. I mean, also Greta Thunberg talking about, I want you to panic. I mean, every communications person would have said, don't talk about fear, don't scare people off. You know, they do all the things we wouldn't do as professionals and then suddenly it works and it's good. Yeah, but um, I think before the big, um, another big trigger for this debate was also in 2018 when we had a heat wave and a drought, which is still, um, hang on. So um, we have several years of droughts now and we see the consequences. So in the first year we saw that the rivers didn't have a high level. So um, ships, uh, for example, in Germany, transporting goods for high inter energy intensive uh, uh, industries on the river Rhine, they couldn't really move on the river. So you saw real impacts of climate change. And now you see that the forest parts of the German forests are not, you cannot um, save them anymore. They, they're gonna be destroyed. And I see now with people seeing the consequences of climate change, I think that has also been quite a game changer on the people's radar. It's not like in the future, it's now. And though we have worse consequences on other continents, you know, I mean, Germany and Europe will be quite well off compared to others. Mm -hmm. Um, this is something that that makes people nervous, I would say. Yeah, so um, this student movement, um, we had uh, elections in the EU in 2019 and in March, uh, in, in May, I think, and um, in the run-up to the election, we were thinking about how can we make climate an issue? And somebody said, let's be honest, climate will not be a key priority in this election campaign. And it became. And one of the consequences was that the new uh, head of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, a German conservative, um, made climate a key priority in her uh, agenda. And um, she announced a Green Deal, which is a set of legislation. Uh, the heads of states have agreed to climate neutrality in 2050. And we're currently negotiating, uh, fingers crossed, an increased NDC for the European Union uh, in 2030. So we want to move it up from, I think, 20, for, for 45 to 55%. So, I mean, this needs to come with measures. So, but we've seen progress. And I think the latest um, has been in the UK. I mean, the UK leaving the EU, uh, obviously, but still um, uh, just announcing, uh, or um, and they have already announced a phase out of the um, combustion engine sales in, I think it was in 2035 or 2040, and now they now have uh, moved it uh, to 2030, and the uh, phase of, of, of hybrid cars in 2033, five. So mm -hmm. that's, this is a major game changer and like one of those icon iconic uh, moments um, where we see stuff is happening. It's not happening at the pace we need, but um, yeah, I'm quite optimistic at the end of uh, 2020 <laughs> that um, there will be quite some movement in the next year. All right. So I understand that you're saying the Paris Agreement was a very bit big thing also for public awareness. And then Fridays for Future might have even been a bigger thing. And we see the results of this in some of the elections that we've had in the last two years or so. This is very recent, right? We're talking very recent history. Yeah, yeah. So um, it has yeah. changed just last year. That's so true. I think that has been really, yeah. That's true. Florentina, I wonder if those two things were also very big in Japan. I mean, you've lived and worked there and you travel very often. What can you tell us about the situation in Japan? It is similar in some ways, but also very different, right? Mm -hmm. So there are certainly some similarities and some big differences. And I'll go back a little bit to what um, Bushra said, because something struck me. Because, um, you know, Japan has almost no, or basically has no fossil fuel resources. Um, and it's a highly industrialized country. Yet, like Oman, it perceives itself as almost irrelevant in global climate change and mitigation efforts. Even though, I mean, Japan alone 
emits a third of the EU's greenhouse gas emissions mm -hmm. as one country. And yet it says, well, if we compare ourselves to China and the US, what we do is almost, well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't make a difference. So I found that to be quite interesting that it often comes up in um, public opinion surveys that Japanese people are very aware of climate change, mm -hmm. but it's not high on the voting agenda. So Japan has, ha um, has finally, well, has finally, you know, um, its own Green Party, but that was established in 2012. And it's been able to win seats mainly in large metropolitan areas at the city level. So not a big voting issue. And also most people will say that they don't see how Japan can make a difference. The discourse is often about how Japan can help other countries, like for example, emerging economies um, or economies in transition in Southeast Asia. Um, how mm -hmm. Japan can export its energy efficient technology to those countries and thereby help reduce their emissions and maybe potentially buy their carbon credits. Um, so that is a big topic for Japan. Now, That's really interesting to me. Sorry to interrupt, but I did not expect that from Japan. Interesting to hear. <laughs> right, so it, it's almost like there are two perspectives. So the, the yeah. po politicians also talk about it that way, but then when they come um, in contact with the international debate and they go to climate change negotiations, so for example, in Paris, um, of course they want to present Japan as a proactive country, but they've very much been struggling over the last 10 years, at least, if not 15 years, to really do something. So I find there's an interesting contrast. And um, one thing, so Japan doesn't really see itself as a big actor, and it discusses climate change mainly as an energy and economic topic. So for one, because it can export technology, because Japan has highly efficient technology. On the other hand, um, another similarity to Oman, Japan gets very hot in the summer, cold in the winter, and for both cooling and heating, they mainly use um, air conditioning units that just run on electricity. So the, the amount of emissions that come from electricity generation is extremely high in Japan, much higher than in many European countries. So here they really think about climate as a domestic energy issue, and the rest is sort of just to be dealt with in terms of energy efficiency and helping other countries do their share. And the Paris yeah. Agreement, yeah. Has, still, if I may just add that, because that's very interesting. It's a point that um, a colleague of mine has made, uh, Yasuko Kameyama, she uh, is a researcher in Japan, has uh, done some research on how the transnational networks of both NGOs, but also um, the private sector that came together as part of the Paris Agreement and afterwards has really shifted the perception of many companies and also cities and NGOs. So even though the Paris Agreement hasn't really affected the Japanese government so much, it has actually really helped build momentum in the Japanese private sector amongst cities and amongst yeah, NGOs to really not just push for stronger climate action, but to simply take action. And that I find absolutely fascinating. And they also are an interesting point, Florentina, because the Japan that I know, and I've been there in 2006 and 10 as a researcher in a different field, um, I basically didn't see any you know, public debate on political issues, no NGOs that were really getting into these issues. Is that something that has changed or did I just live in different communities where I didn't see you know, the, these, these NGOs? Because it's really not something that I, that I connected in Japan or to, to my idea of Japan when it came to the political system. People were in general very reserved and quiet about their political views. It wasn't a very normal thing, I thought, to be open and active in an NGO. Is that something that has changed? Maybe even due to climate issues? I don't know. Um, I, no, I wouldn't say that. Um, it's still the case that uh, what an NGO is in Japan is fundamentally different from what okay. we think of. Like, um, the Greenpeace Japan group is really small. So anything that aims at actually bringing people together at a national level, level to really yeah, put pressure on the central government, that's not happening that much. But what you see is that so many local groups have formed to say, we'll be an NPO 
And we will make sure that our environment is as clean as it gets, that we invest into renewable energy. And so local action has really taken off also together with many cities deciding to join the 100% renewable energy regions movement, etc. So it's not very visible to the outside because most of it is on the local level. It happens in Japanese. There's no big coverage of it. There was no Fridays for Future or the few small gatherings that you had, if you looked at pictures, were half foreign nationals or um, mixed Japanese foreign national couples with their kids. So people who are very much in touch with foreign discourses, not so much Japanese people themselves. So it's, a lot is happening, but it has a very different dynamic than what we see here in Germany. Okay, I see. I was wondering, is there something that um, you know from Oman at all? Have you even, uh, are you even aware of the Fridays for Future movement? I was wondering because it's very big over here, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not in every country, right? Have you heard about it, Bushra? <laughs> Shall we talk a little bit more about it? I mean, uh, I personally pride myself as being someone who knows a bit about the climate, but. I'll be honest here, I, I haven't heard it personally, so, um, yeah. and I haven't heard anyone speak about it in the country. <laughs> so Katja needs to tell you a little bit about it, because she says it's very important over here. Yes. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm struck that uh, people did a great communication effort to, to sell it as a global movement. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, so um, Greta Thunberg um, is one of the icons of, um, of this movement. So she's a student from uh, Sweden and she decided she will not go to back to school on Fridays until we solve the climate issue. Okay. And it was the thing in the end, uh, she started to do that in August uh, 2018. And then this got traction and at the beginning of 2019, this became really big in Germany. So students stopped to go to school on Fridays and instead they went to their local um, well, municipalities or uh, in Berlin to the ministries and they demonstrated in front of those um, ministries. And then in the, this context, there were supporter groups, supporter groups built. So for example, you now have scientists for future. They, these are quite renowned, for example, um, quite renowned climate scientists who, for example, support them. If they have questions, if they want to teach each other about climate change, they provide presentations, they provide materials, they, then there are the parents for future, which say, we support you, they're the grandparents for future, doctors for future, you know, people will say, um, this is a major health issue. I mean, these are mostly people you've seen around earlier, so, um, but they come together in this news entities and say, like, we support a group of this movement, and um, there were, I mean, on the biggest strike day in Germany overall, there were 100,000 students going to the streets and supporters so standing in the front of the ministries and challenging the government and really pushing it so it has been a major success here and how global is it if i might if i may ask is it only around europe or has it gone more so now that you say it i'm not so sure i, I think there's quite a movement in the u.s as well um france great britain obviously and some countries um i mean it's differently. I mean, Poland has their own Greta Thunberg, their own icon of this demonstration, so also refused to go to school uh, and their demonstrations, but in different uh, sizes, I would say. But um, I mean, I, I follow it on Twitter. So my impression is it's all around the world, but that's a great <laughs> comms job done there, actually. <laughs> we can ask Florentina, have you heard about it from uh, any countries in Asia? Um, not so much, actually. Like in, in Japan, it was practically non-existent and also not necessarily viewed as a positive thing because not going to school really goes against Japanese cultural norms. So, so that in Germany, it, it was discussed. In Japan, that sort of behavior was seen by many as yeah. absolutely unacceptable. Like yeah. you, you, can, you can feel the desire to do something about climate change, but that's no reason to become a lunatic and start skipping school. So these are <laughs> so far removed from each other, the two things that it was, yeah, for many was very difficult to accept, I think. That's true. That's actually an interesting point about the globality of this movement, right? Because maybe in, in Germany, culturally, 
you can be a let's say positively connotated rebel by not going to school in a way but in so many other countries it's impossible it's the only thing you know it's you could be grateful for any school day that you have or uh, it's just against any cultural norm to skip school for example so that is probably very different in some countries um, I'm finding out today that I'm just as European centered in my mind as Katrin is too, because I also thought it's like the biggest thing, everyone knows it, but it's interesting to talk to you about it and seeing that you do not even know it. Um, it was interesting, Bushka, because you were saying more or less that there is a climate policies and energy policies are, are more or less um, a top down issue rather than a bottom up issue in, in Oman. Is there anything um, that you would, call a grassroots initiative or a local initiative? It's some, it, is it something that um, you've seen uh, in Oman before? It could be about the environment or water issues or, you know, several of these things are probably connected. Um, or is it really not something that um, is part of, of your, you know, society or culture? Um, uh, I think, you know, when it comes to environmental issues, again, it's, nobody feels it's their fault, even when it's local things. I'm not even talking about climate change and international impacts. So for example, we have an issue with water scarcity in the Gulf and we don't have much rain and our reserves, underground reserves for water are very limited. So recently there was a government policy that uh, uh, stopped allowing people to, uh, uh, you know, uh, build, uh, you know, well. get the water out from yeah the wells yeah sorry building wells and getting the water out um without a license and people simply refused it they said you know what you know why do you stop me um when you know i i want the water and i'm getting it for free and actually it's literally drying up some other regions of the country but there's no awareness at all of that. So that issue is not, you know, in the media anywhere. Nobody's talking about it as an issue. And, and this is where I think, you know, just simple awareness, uh, people would change and would, you know, uh, feel like they, they have a responsibility towards the environment. It's this lack of understanding, uh, not, not having any um, information about anything, whether it's local or international. So, um, you know, uh, Florentine, when you were saying Japan is an industrialized country, but doesn't have any fossil fuels, I remember that actually, because we are a large exporter, uh, our energy per uh, PPP dollar, uh, you know, that, that, uh, unit um, when compared internationally we're one of the highest so we we use a lot of energy we we have a lot of energy and therefore we're a large contributor to <laughs> um, any impacts on the environment but people don't look at the numbers because the numbers are not there widely seen and it's just not part of public discourse when we were talking about voting um, yes in a don't vote for the you know, president or prime minister, but we do have a voting for the consultative council every three years. So it's the council that supports the, the, the head of state in policy making. And when this voting session comes and you know, it's, people it try to promote themselves, environmental issues never come in line. You know, they're never part of the things that we're gonna fight for this and that, and we're gonna help you do this. It's never there. You know, it's always economic aspects and social aspects. Right. Uh, yeah, it makes sense, right? Because it's um, probably in, um, you know, when it comes to everyone's uh, closest priorities, I can understand why these issues are, um, are uh, high up on the agenda in, in very many countries. Katrin, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I wanted to ask um, a question. Um, so um, I think one of the working strategies to um, have climate um, more of a priority within the public discourse, but also on the people's radar, is that there's uh, that, well, we were quite successfully uh, linking climate change to fundamental values like security, security of your family, health of your family, gener intergenerational justice, the future of our kids. Um, even it could be better, but you were both saying that you were more talking about economic uh, 
uh, aspects of the transition. And um, yeah, I mean, also leadership, global leadership is one thing that we always put as a, you know, as a framing for Europe. You need to step up, you need to lead globally, blah, blah, moral, blah, blah. Um, is that something that you observe in your, I mean, because Bushra, you said for the people, the environment is actually quite important. So they, they um, is that something you think could be an op option or do you already see that kind of discourses, for example, also in Japan, because that didn't seem to be an issue. I mean, you bring a very interesting point that taking care of the environment is something very uh, important in our religion and Islam. And I think people feel very proud that they are obeying their religion and they are very religious. They're very proud of that. Um, and from this perspective, they feel, yes, of course, we care about the environment. We care about animals. We care about, you know, fellow humans. That's that's the general way into caring for the environment. It's just they don't see the link between their actions and the impacts on the environment. So I think, yeah, um, adding these values, as you say, um, to the discussion and the discourse would could really help uh, with this issue. That's an interesting point, yeah. How about these values in, in Japanese society? What would you say? Well, from a value perspective, that's an interesting, question actually that I'd have to think about for a second so I'm going to start with this point about security and how in Europe it was also linked to yeah um basically the security of every human every citizen and here's something that's peculiar to Japan makes it hard to really push that argument because Japan has been subject to typhoons to earthquakes and to tsunamis for so long that much of um, what has been happening lately has just been perceived as, well, yet another natural disaster. Okay, stronger than we've seen before, but it's sort of the same thing as before. Um, so it really is only happening now. And I think uh, it had to do with the heat waves in 2018 and 19, which did kill an unusual amount of people, especially older people and elderly people and kids. So that really... Uh, caught somebody's attention and the J Japan um, Meteorological Agency actually wrote a report that basically said in the title, these heat waves killed this and this many people and it's due to climate change. So the awareness is now finally shifting, but it really, it's just beginning to shift, I would say. So we're seeing some really interesting developments now. Like actually, um, I think it was just last week on November 19, the Japanese diet adopted a non-binding climate and emergent climate and environment emergency declaration referring to a climate crisis. So this is completely new language that is emerging this year. And it's quite interesting because for a long time, you could say that the high tolerance Japanese have for natural disasters and dealing with it and all the damage that comes with it has sort of rendered this effectiveness argument almost useless for a while. And that is now changing. So I find that quite fascinating that the diet talks of a climate crisis. The Ministry of Environment this year published its white paper. So its annual report about the environment also stating a climate crisis. So I think we're sort of starting to see a shift here in the perception, mm. whether it really translates into this idea that for normative reasons, Japan needs to act. I would still say that probably um, economic opportunities and the perception that maybe there is now the Japanese people's security at stake, that that will be more powerful. However, the other point that you've made about leadership, and if I may, I'll just, I'll keep it quick, but there was also a question by um, Philip about Japan in the international negotiations, and especially the Kyoto Protocol, that Japan in the 1990s really wanted to show leadership in climate negotiations hosted the Kyoto Protocol, and then struggled to implement it. And there are actually a number of um, climate policy researchers, so most notably Rie Watanabe and Yasuko Kamayama, that have very forcefully argued that if it hadn't borne the name of Japan's ancient capital and still cultural capital, Japan would have not made an effort, or not made this effort to meet the Kyoto target. And if you look at how it met the target, basically Japan spent I think it was the equivalent of a few million euros on buying carbon credits so that on paper they meet the target. And the um, ca carbon emission graphs that take this into account basically go like this 2011, 12, mm -hmm. 
30. So <laughs> um, it really, I mean, it, yeah, it was very important for Japan to keep its reputation intact but it's not in any place to take a leadership role. And unfortunately, that also has to do with often quite bad English language skills, that Japanese negotiators <laughs> struggle yeah. through negotiations and other countries' delegations sometimes struggle to understand them. So there's definitely a big language barrier mm. there, but also not necessarily a lack, uh, not necessarily a willingness to change this and to take more of a leadership role. That's an interesting point. I mean, there are several interesting points. One is that reputation is uh, also a very big pressure point, right? I mean, you could, you know, your values could be totally screwed, but only due to reputational issues, you could be doing the right thing. Right? <laughs> and I'm hoping for, you know, more pressure, uh, more, you know, external pressure uh, to get some people to go the, the right direction just for reputational uh, reasons that would also be helpful or maybe Katrin would disagree but you know I just want to say that uh, pride is also value so maybe you can catch them ah, yeah. Very good. <laughs> yeah right yeah but like issues like intergenerational justice the future of our kids I mean in in Europe um, a significant share of the population is Christian uh, half of them are Catholic or even a little more and um it's probably a very deeply held Catholic value to preserve nature because it was uh, created by God. So there is a parallel, I think, in, in some um, social groups in Germany about conserving nature due to a religious belief and a deeply held and very uh, culturally normative belief system in, in Europe. It's, we're very often talking about Japan as being not really formally religious, they have traditions and um, they have um, semi-religious um, um, acts and and uh, festivals, but it's it's something that we're discussing in a different way, right? In Japan, like the religi religious norms are more flexible, rather open, not so personal. Is is there any connection at all to these issues? Can you find one about, you know, generations caring about your kids, caring about nature? I mean, nature is a very strong, um, very strong emotional thing in Germany, uh, as well as in Japan, I would say. Well, Japan actually has its own animistic so um, religion, which basically honors nature for right. its ability to always um, basically regrow and to always um, emerge fresh and almost untarnished again. So they do um, yeah, revere nature, but it hasn't really translated much into policy, I would say. But actually this point about yeah, pride as a value, you can say that this more Confucian value um, of saving face, that is very strong and that definitely plays into Japan being rather susceptible to international pressure. But it took a leadership role in the 1990s after being openly named and shamed for not playing a bigger military role despite having um, lots of economic power. Then it decided to become a climate leader. And then last year, Japan wasn't allowed to speak at the UN Climate Action Summit because it was burning so much coal still that it was seen as one of the laggards this year, the government announced to look into coal financing and some institutes have announced that they'll stop doing it. So um, I, I, I wouldn't say that I'm actually calling on people to, to sort of sort out Japan and name and shame it, but I feel like if more international actors did that, it could actually prove somewhat um, effective in pushing Japan in that direction because they are very susceptible to this idea of keeping their reputation intact. Right. It sounds like if a Katrin's NGO would be working in, in Japan, one of their strategies could be addressing the fact that you have committed to something, you know, you need to step up for it, else you're losing your reputation uh, internationally. This could be a strategy and will be different for Germany, I'm pretty sure. Zakia, hi, you've entered the session. Do you have any uh, questions from the audience uh, for us? Exactly. So we have 12 minutes um, left. This has been a great session and I don't want it to end, but um, I know Florentina, you have a, a lecture soon. So I just wanted to keep, um, make sure we all have that in mind. And we have, we do have one question and I have several questions. So um, if that's okay with you, Catherine, yeah. um, I'd like to ask them. 
So first of all, um, what is the role of science in your respective countries advising on climate change? Um, Katrin, I saw that you, you did answer it very thoroughly. Thank you for that in the chat. Uh, no, sorry, I think I, I posted it in the wrong chat and it wasn't, oh, okay. I just wanted to... We're running in another chat while we're talking. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, but right, so the role of science as an advisor to policymakers, maybe even to the public. Um, Katrin, do you want to go first? Uh, sure, um, I make it quickly because I, I'm super interested in to hear the other answers. So um, I think it's um, one of the major calls from, from the movement to say, listen to the scientists. And actually, there has been quite some effort in, in Europe, uh, but mainly in the US, to discredit scientists. Um, Still, I think there are um, an important voice and through the Corona crisis, interestingly, I would say they've become a more important uh, voice because uh, we've seen now scientists advising governments on how to act on a crisis. And um, I mean, of course that's disputed as well, but still they, we see a role model of how policies can made and different difficult decisions can be made. So um, generally I say scientists have a high reputation in Germany, but I mean, we're very far from, from, their, um, ex from their recommendations. So um, maybe we have an opportunity now with the Corona crisis, giving a role model of policy, policy um, advice um, we can follow. Right, Florentina, uh, scientists in Japan, do they play a major role? Uh, yes and no. They do, but not the way that we might necessarily think they do. So basically, climate policy making has a lot to do with um, bureaucracy in Japan. So ministries basically trying to find a consensus between different positions, often the Ministry of Environment and the Ministry of Economy, and both have their own research institutes. They used to be officially linked. Now they are officially not linked, but they still fund them. And basically these um, then put together reports, provide them to their ministries, which will use them in trying to negotiate the next policy with the other ministries. So if you want to know what their negotiations or discussions are about, it's often quite interesting to just um, attend these workshops that, for example, the National Institute um, of Environmental Studies will do with its um, more economy-centered counterpart. There you really get sort of the arguments that scientists bring forward. And there is unfortunately a, still a bit of a disconnect between the Japanese climate science and international, at least, I mean, not, not like a complete cut, but they're not as integrated as European scientists, I would say into the international debate, often because of language barriers. Um, and so, Yes, there is a lot of input, but not necessarily the way we are used to it here now. Therefore, I was really happy to hear that so many sub-state or non-state actors really came in touch with this global climate debate as part of the Paris Agreement and the following COPs, because I feel that's a very important kind of knowledge exchange that's happening there, because otherwise it's a very elitist sort of perception of what's going on in Japan. Right. And I'm wondering what it is like in, in Oman. Do you have something like a science advisor to the government? How does it work? Uh, to be honest, in Oman, I think it's uh, surprisingly very similar to Japan. And I'm really surprised in this session how similar Oman and Japan are in many ways. Um, so scientists are sort of called in when a minister wants to do something, you know? So if he wants to, fix a problem, he'll call a scientist to help him fix it in a certain way. But it's not the other way around. It's not a scientist finding out that, oh, this is really bad and let's raise awareness and let's change what's going on and, you know, or public discussion or so forth. So um, even if sometimes um, general knowledge says that actually this doesn't really make sense, but if the policymaker would want this action moving forward, he'll get more scientists to make a strong case for it. And, you know, science would only help his position further. And if it doesn't help, it's hidden, you know, <laughs> and that's, that's simply the way um, science works. I yeah. I understand. Yeah. Zakia, did you also have a, a, a question that you wanted to ask? Right. Um, um, there's um, one more um, question. Oh, hi. <laughs> yeah, one more um, 
question from the audience, um, and that goes in the similarities between Oman and Japan. And um, they are asking whether um, if Oman and Japan rather look to the EU or to, to the US with regards to climate and energy policy. Uh, that's a great question, yeah. It, like internationally, I was gonna ask about cooperation. Maybe there are countries that you're strongly tied to, but leadership is also a great question. Um, Bushra, do you wanna go first? Uh, I definitely have to say both. Uh, we don't, you know, we, we wouldn't differentiate. We'll, we'll always look at US, we'll always look at um, EU, but we'll also look at the MENA region, Middle East, North Africa region. And actually, usually the MENA region is, you know, it, it impacts us more than EU and US. EU and US are always seen as, okay, they're leaders, they're the best in the world, we don't have to be the best in the world, you know, like them. Let, let's see what our neighbors are doing, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I guess here we actually have a difference between Oman and, and Japan because Japan very much looks towards the US. Mm -hmm. This is because um, Japan and the US since uh, the 60s have had um, a security <laughs> alliance. The US guarantees Japan security, it keeps it under its nuclear umbrella, etc. So there are tens of thousands of US soldiers stationed in Japan. It's a very close relationship just in foreign policy in general. So at the, during the Kyoto Protocol negotiations, Japan was busy trying to somehow find the middle ground between the US and EU positions to keep the US on board. And um, Unfortunately, they have been more proactive in following not so constructive US administrations. Um, and they were almost a bit of at a loss when it came to the Obama administration actually taking proact yeah, proactive stance on climate because Japan wasn't really prepared for that. Um, but it did things like it adopted 2005 as a base year for its emissions reductions because the US did. Well, they, they then abandoned it and moved it to 2013 because of the nuclear accident. But for a long time, they were actually following the US very closely. And yeah, so the, some say that um, the recent announcement by Japan's Prime Minister Suga that Japan will aim at carbon neutrality by 2050, well, actually had a lot to do with China making that move mm -hmm. and it becoming oh, clear yeah. that the Biden administration will do the same thing. So Japan sort of yeah, reacted to China and to the election outcome and declared it itself. So definitely more US than EU. That's true. Yeah, it's interesting how strong these international mm, perspectives are, right? And how they, they um, impact each other. Zakia, since we have only a few minutes left, do you want to uh, also uh, ask the question that you had? Can we get a quick answer? Um, right. I'm not sure if it's a quick answer, but I'm going to take advantage of the all-woman panel here and ask how your experiences um, working in the field has been, like in your respective countries. Um, are women involved actually in decision-making processes at the higher and local level in Japan and in Oman? And what would you like to see changed? And then my last comment would be, because we don't have time to go into it, is that I think the Fridays for Future movement has also been very predominantly female. And I, would, I wanted to ask Katrin why you think that is, or if you have any opinions on that. All right, so Katrin can think about the Fridays for Future and the feminine icons that they have. And Boschka and Florentine, women in Japan and in Oman, are they decision makers? Are they um, part of the power circles? Uh, I'll, I'll give a quick uh, answer maybe, uh, given the limited amount of time. Definitely, uh, there are, uh, I think four or, or to six ministers that are female uh, in Oman right now. There are lots of female uh, power heads and actually females, you know, when you look at it from the top uh, bottom, they, they have all the strength, uh, females, whether it's corporate or uh, government. Uh, when it comes to, you know, uh, socially and social circles, maybe that's the difficult uh, aspect of uh, a woman becoming stronger. So once you're in a sort of safe social circle where they support uh, a woman growing to leadership positions, uh, the government opens the way all, all the way, whether it's climate policies or other policies. All right, that's good to know. Florentina, are you as happy about the Japanese <laughs> parity? 
I'm afraid we have yet another difference between Oman and Japan that actually in Japan has um, a, an extremely low share of uh, female decision makers in the parliament, if not the lowest among all OECD countries. Mm -hmm. um, it has hardly any female ministers. And so basically as part of my field work on nuclear safety and nuclear policy, I started joking at some point that, you know, I've, I've come to Japan to spend half a year talking with old men. Um, so, because all of my interview partners were men above 50, basically. But then on the positive side, many of the researchers I've met in environmental policy in climate policy are female. And there is, maybe this goes back to the NGO or um, a sort of a science and policy making question also, there is one new renewable energy think tank, the Renewable Energy Institute, which tries to influence energy policy making and employs a lot of women. So I find that really positive that in this field, there's so many women who are really active now trying to shape policy making. But in the traditional decision making circles, women are still highly underrepresented. All right. Okay. So it's good for them that you see something's changing, right? And uh, Kathleen, we've talked about Fridays for Future. We haven't talked about who's actually uh, involved in this group. And Zakia's theory is um, there are a lot of uh, female students involved. Is this something that um, uh, is correct? Do you have a theory why that is? So yeah, um, actually I've never really thought about it, um, but uh, my spontaneous answer would be that um, structural discrimination in Germany starts at a later age. So um, it's when women um, pursue their career path and then it's a per you know, decision whether you're gonna be promoted or not. But specifically in university or in school, I think uh, that's quite a level playing field between men and women. So that would be my guess on this. But I mean, generally, I think in the climate diplom diplomacy field, there are a lot of women. So for example, Jennifer Morgan as head of Greenpeace or um, leading figures for the Paris Agreement were, uh, for example, our CEO, Laurence Tubiana or the uh, UNFCCC uh, had um, Christiana Figueroa. So this is more female, while the energy sector, the transportation sector, the um, industry sector, this is very male dominated. So decision makers and companies and so on. Um, in the political sphere, uh, there are a lot of women and I mean, we have a German, uh, Germany has a female chancellor, the head of the EU is a, a woman. So I think there's there are efforts to make it more diverse or less, um, uh, gender uh, balanced. But yeah, well, let's see. I mean, I, I have not yet seen whether there's a, whether the, the climate, the movement from the Fridays for Future has a specific if, um, feminist approach or not. Maybe it doesn't need it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's really interesting question. Question would be worth uh, getting deeper into exploration, right? I know, but then unfortunately, it's two thirty, and Florentina wants to say something. Go ahead. There's one female figure I should mention. I feel and that's um, Yuriko Koike. She used to be Japan's environmental minister and is now the mayor of Tokyo. And Tokyo introduced as one of the first city in the world. It, in, it introduced a citywide emissions trading scheme is really pushing renewable energies. And so in that position, she can actually make things happen and she is trying to do that. So um, as the mayor of 30 million people, basically, she has some decision-making power certainly. And it's interesting to see what she does and how, where it will go. Right, that's true, yeah. You can read about her in the international press. Um, all right, well, it is, um, with the very sad eye that I have to close this session now because we've already talked for an hour. And uh, I'm not sure if you know this, but uh, I didn't um, pick Germany and Oman and Japan without a reason, but these countries in a way are, are similar in the sense that, for example, their, uh, their area in square kilometers is pretty similar, but then they have this great diversity in everything else. For example, the fact that from 5 million to 83 to, I don't know, 126 million or so, the population is so different. The uh, state of industrialization is uh, so different. The resources are very dis uh, distributed very unevenly. Um, so all of these things probably lead to the very different perspective that we, that we have just um, heard. Um, can I ask you a final very quick question, though, um, because I've learned so many new things today. Could you mention just the one thing that um, 
you found the most interesting or one thing that was really surprisingly new to you. Um, at the end of the session, Katrin, can I ask you first? I've never thought about uh, energy uh, politics in Oman, so I learned uh, a lot today. And um, I, I find it absolutely worth exploring what is this, this uh, love for nature, but but the person in it, what, what does that really mean? And um, yeah, so um, that was super interesting. And also from, from Japan, so just uh, super inspiring. And I mean, generally global movement uh, questions and so on. So that was uh, quite revelating. Yeah, that, I, I agree. Uh, Bushka, how did you like the session? Is anything that um, surprised you about it? So I certainly learned about the Fridays for Futures <laughs> movement, and I'm, um, I apologize for not knowing about it uh, before, but I'll definitely spread the word. Uh, and I, I was very surprised though at how similar Japan and Oman were uh, in their, you know, attitude towards uh, climate. Uh, even though we're very different countries, you know, um, uh, you know, industrially and 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 you know, culturally, but the way we view climate, I, I thought, were very similar. So it's it's interesting. Um, the the entire session was very interesting. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, since, um, since in my research, I study Germany and Japan, and I live in Germany, so these are the th the countries I'm most familiar with. I was also most struck by the similarities between Oman and Japan, and that both. In both countries, people love the environment and yet they don't feel like they can or should take action. And I wonder whether that will change in the future, maybe if also climate science is translated or communicated in, in terms that make it clear that the environment they love will change if they don't act, if that could maybe be a framing that could work to mobilize people, I wonder. Right. Yeah, thank you so much for thank you so much for coming. This might have just been the best session in this whole conference, but I don't know. You have to attend the other ones as well. Um, the uh, I'm I'm very positive at the end of the session because some of the things that you said are giving me a let's say optimistic view on the fact that there is a global setting or substance for climate justice for climate issues. And I think that is one of the most important things. If it's just the German thing or, you know, just something in a small region or a city somewhere else, um, it's not gonna go as far as it should. So I'm leaving the session with a very, very optimistic uh, view. So thank you so much for that. And I hope you have a wonderful afternoon or uh, evening at wherever you are. And for the uh, attendance of this uh, session and conference, there is a coffee and tea break coming up where you can join our ally at their yurt. All right. Thank you for the session. You have a good afternoon. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> I also just want to say uh, the session will be available online until the end of the year. So you can also feel free to share. And I'm sure many people will be logging on to see it afterwards. So. But great to be part of yeah, it. Yeah, it was pretty great. Thank you so much. I really did learn a lot. It was it was pretty good. And uh, Boshka, how many kids do you have? Uh, the one daughter you saw <laughs> that I need ah, to hug right now and give her some love back. <laughs> but do, do you think she speaks? Uh, do, does she speak English? Uh, slightly. She's learning, um, okay. but she does a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> how old is she? She's three. Ah, okay, I see. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> uh, we sometimes get the same thing, thing over here. And I think it's just, it was very cute. All right, so you have a great evening, right? Thank you for uh, for attending and um, let's all stay in touch. That would be great. Yes, please. Thank you for having me and I, I need to run and teach climate politics. <laughs> <laughs> all right, bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>